Hi, welcome to Distinti's New Wave Theory. This is the third lecture. This is on the diffraction anomaly. We're going to discuss what diffraction is and show that existing models mimic it but do not explain it. And therefore, it's an anomaly. And then we're going to go through what's required for us to explain it. We're not going to explain it yet. We're going to set the foundation to later allow us to explain it. And we're going to remember the rule of acquisition 2A, which is new rule of acquisition, which says where there is pain, there is gain. In other words, pain is an, an, an analogy for a paradoxes, anomalies, inconsistencies, and nonsense. And Niels Bohr said, how wonderful that we've met with a paradox, now we have some hope of making progress. Now, if we watch water waves, this is a sea gate. These are ocean waves coming in parallel to the sea gate. And as the waves pass through the opening in the sea gate, one would assume sea gate is going to clip the rest of the waves, that these waves will just travel unhindered like this. However, because water wants to flow from higher levels to lower levels, this water is going to flow. And this water is going to flow. And the water over here is going to flow. And the water over here is going to flow. This water is going to want to flow in. This water is going to flow in, etc., etc. And so what we have is we end up with this, which you end up getting rings around the ocean. If we look at this from the top, you end up with this. And this is what we call diffraction. So for water waves to implement diffraction, it's because the waves, the medium which carries the waves, can flow. We know that light waves do the same thing. Unfortunately, the model that we use the best, the model that works the best for us, which is Euler's model, is a mimic for waves that does not anticipate this phenomenon. However, we engineers are pretty good at mimicking the phenomenon using Euler's, because what we'll do is when we know we have an aperture, we'll apply and we'll apply Euler's equation, and we sometimes say this is a Fourier analysis to do our far fielding, and we'll use, we'll apply Euler's equation this way to get the wave propagation spherically about the aperture. And then what we do is, for each one of these endpoints, we'll apply a compensation model to adjust the amplitude to get closer to what we observe. We do that all the time when we do far field projection of near field data. We take a spherical projection from each probe sample point, and then we apply the probe compensation in the far field. And that's all we're doing. We're mimicking this diffraction uh, with models that do, don't account for the diffraction. In other words, we're mimicking the phenomenon using a fundamental principle. This model is a line of sight model. It does not tell us that diffraction occurs. So what do we need to explain this phenomenon? Well. We need a thing called divergence. When stuff flows out of an imaginary volume, that's called positive divergence. When stuff flows into an imaginary volume, that's called negative divergence. And the divergence comes in two basic forms. One is called source divergence, whereas if somewhere in space you have this imaginary source, this magical source that produces water, let's say, um, just creates water from nothingness and water flows out. And since it's flowing out of this imaginary surface, that's creating source. In other words, you have a source existing inside of that sphere. Because you have a source existing inside of this imaginary volume, and since water only flows out, then you have a divergent source or source divergence. Another way to explain divergence is, let's say you, these, these are imaginary volumes inside of a bathtub, and you're letting the water in the bathtub drain out. Well, because this guy's already empty, its divergence is zero. Since this guy has the same inflow that it has outflow, that has zero divergence. But because you have water actually flowing out of this one, this one's emptying, that's positive divergence. This is what we call flow divergence. Now, if I increase the water in the bathtub, water's going to be flowing into this volume, and this is going to experience negative divergence. In other words, it's, it's absorbing water. Water's flowing from the outside into this volume. Okay, and so what's happening here is this wave that went past the Seagate, because it's going to want to flow from a higher concentration to a lower, and these little ones flow in and those flow out, that's, that's divergence. The, the medium is diverging. It's flowing from higher concentrations to lower concentrations. That's divergence also. That is the same definition as source divergence, which is the only kind of divergence that the electromagnetic models account for. And so, do we have Maxwell to the rescue? No, we don't, because, uh, by the way, this is a 
woman that allegedly has a tattoo of Maxwell's equations on her back. Okay. I picked it up because I get mathtattoos.com and I'm like, okay, that's ridiculous. That's a ridiculous enough to me for me to include as a slide. Okay, first of all, from the introductory video, I showed you that Maxwell's equations do not describe the behavior of light properly. And secondly, there's no provision in Maxwell's equations for the divergence of fields. And so we can't explain uh, diffraction using field flow. Because if we look at the divergence models from Maxwell's equation, it says that there's no divergence in a magnetic field at all. Here we have only source divergence, which says if we have an electric field diverging, that can only occur if there's sources inside the volume that you're looking at. This is called source divergence. If you, when we do the modeling in Maxwell's equations of mag electromagnetic waves in free space, because there's no charge in free space, this is the condition we use. There is no divergence of electric or magnetic fields. And if electric and magnetic fields are the only thing that comprise electromagnetic radiation and divergence is not allowed in electric or magnetic fields, then there is no way, no way to describe re diffraction using these models. And anybody out there that says, well, they've got a model that doesn't know, you're applying, you're doing what we did before, you're applying models cleverly to mimic the phenomenon because the equations that are trying to explain how light works do not account for divergence and therefore cannot account for diffraction. Again, there are many clever techniques that mimic this, this diffraction phenomenon to great accuracy. However, the techniques are only applied because we have observed the phenomenon. In other words, we're, we're applying other techniques to mimic the phenomenon because it's not predicted for in the fundamental equations that we credit with explaining light. Are my models new electromagnetism? No, my models suffer the same problem. They're line of sight models which do not account for the diffraction or the sorry the divergence of, of the fields. So we need an improved model of light to allow us to actually go and complete the electromagnetic field models. So how do we go forward? Since other wave phenomena diffract, water waves, sound waves, all waves, we're going to study them first. But wait, the diffraction of those waves occur because the medium is divergent. In other words, it can be compressible and can flow to lower from higher to low pressure. But there's supposedly no medium for light, so how do we handle this? Well, let's talk about the ether myth. Let's take a sidetrack here. Go back to the 1800s, and because light embodied all the properties associated with, with regular waves that exist in a medium, early scientists went in search of the medium for light. They called this medium the luminiferous ether. And they made a lot of assumptions. They thought it was a very fine material that occupies the space between the matter and as the Earth moves around the Sun, it must at some point in the air be moving relative to the ether. So they developed what's called the Michelson-Morley experiment, which is a two-arm interferometer. In other words, if we're moving relative to ether, one arm should experience a difference in the fringe shift in the inter interferometry based on the other arm. Well, this is a very sensitive experiment, and it resulted in absolutely nothing. No, they could not detect any shift in the fringe, which means either we're not moving through ether or there's no ether or something else. So how did they resolve the situation? Well, they applied a fudge factor. They surmised that the only way a null result could be obtained is if the length of the experiment was contracting along the direction of the motion through the ether. And born is the Lorentz Fitzgerald contraction hypothesis. Where this, my friends, is not the velocity of the experiment. This is the velocity of the experiment relative to ether. Yes. You think I'm lying? Well, Einstein agrees. Lawrence and Fitzgerald rescued the theory, the ether theory, from this difficulty by assuming that the motion of the body relative to the ether produces a contraction of the body in the direction of motion. You can read the rest of this on your own. This is in Wikipedia, Michelson Morley experiment. So Einstein agrees that Michelson and Morley, or the, sorry, the Lorentz and Fitzgerald rescued the ether model. And the ether model has been rescued. And that's what my modeling, that's what my theory of theorem mechanics is based on. And what I've been able to do with the limited uh, stuff that I've developed is I've been able to show the electromagnetic induction, gravity, inertia are all the same phenomenon. A true unification. Not just they're similar, but they're identical in mechanism. The massive bodies consume ether as a fuel. Go watch video 21. I get correct stellar aberration results, which the general theory of relativity screws up. 
and explains the precession of Mercury without overunity. And so where I was going in the beginning is I was trying to go in a straight line from new electromagnetism to the pretonic models, to the ethonic models, to a new wave model. But unfortunately, I, I realized that I need to have divergence of fields. And this, these do not predict that. The experiments that are the foundation for this are not able to f measure this phenomenon because we need a, we, they need actual propagation in space, not benchtop experiments. Therefore, the new route that we're going, as we're going to, we have already have new electromagnetism, which are bench top experiments derived empirical models, and we're going to develop these new wave models and hopefully work our way down to the more fundamental pretonic and ethonic models. Again, this is what we say. we need better models that express the divergent field flows to be explained again in the next video, which one is complementary displacement and flow divergence. And we have to remember the account, the existing electromagnetic field models do not account for this phenomenon. And this is an anomaly which gives us great information, this diffraction anomaly. And we have the green light for ether. We're going to continue studying water, learn its properties and behaviors, and then use that to, um, as an analogy to develop more comp comprehensive ether models. But we want to learn more about waves. Let's see if we can't use the Helmholtz wave equation to help us explain divergent flow. Thank you very much.